Harry, and uh, it's nice to be back with you. As you can see out of my window behind there, um, it's dark here. Uh, not only is it the second night, but, uh, you know, Shabbat here comes in around four o'clock now, a bit before four o'clock. Uh, so we can light from about 4.30, quarter to five. Um, so, uh, yeah, so second day Hanukkah, guys. Uh, I, I got here already. Please follow me into it in due course. Um, so here we have this festival of Hanukkah. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, if we asked ourselves, what do we know about Hanukkah? We all know about the little pot of oil, don't we? Uh, that lasted for eight days. Um, uh, and that's why it's an eight day festival, isn't it? Um, and so on. Uh, but there are a lot of surprises and um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the surprises of the story of Hanukkah. Just suffice to say, if you look in the classical uh, Siddur, in the traditional uh, liturgy, uh, you will see an extra paragraph that we add uh, for Hanukkah in the Amida, in the benching, it's an extra paragraph. If you have a look at it, it talks about the miracles and the wonders and the amazing things. And it gives you the story and the time of Matijau and his sons. Da, 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 da. It doesn't say anything about the miracle of the oil. That's a coincidence, isn't that interesting? Uh, we know about Hanukkah, for the oldest text that tells us about Hanukkah is the book of the Maccabees. There are two books of the Maccabees and they tell us the story of Hanukkah, right? So that's a good place to look, isn't it? To find the story of Hanukkah. They don't mention the miracle of the oil. Well, that's a surprise, isn't it? Right? If you didn't know that, that's kind of weird. The book of the Maccabees doesn't mention the miracle of the oil. And yet, here we all are, chomping on donuts and eating latkes because of the oil. So what's that about? Why is it an eight-day festival according to the book of the Maccabees? Well, they rededicated the temple on the 25th of Kislev, yeah, now. Uh, and the last festival that they were unable to celebrate in the temple was Sukkot. Right, that was the last festival, and therefore they instituted an eight-day festival. That's what the Book of the Maccabees says. That's why Hanukkah is eight days, because it's an eight-day festival. They're doing, as it were, a late Sukkot. I don't think they actually sat in Sukkot, but they had an eight-day festival in the temple. Of course, they did light the light, because it had gone out and they wanted to relight it. Um, but the Book of the Maccabees doesn't mention the miracle of the oil. Okay. Uh, so we all light the Hanukkiyot, you know, we add an extra light, da -da -da, we put it in the windows, uh, all of that stuff. Um, it's the Talmud around four, five hundred years later, five hundred years or so, uh, which mentions the miracle of the oil. And the Talmud tells you how you're supposed to celebrate Hanukkah. Right? You all know what you do. I'm sure you all do it. You light a light and you stick it in the doorway, right? Do you? You light a light and you stick it in the doorway. Each night you light a light, stick it in the doorway. No. We have a Hanukkah. We add an extra light, right? Where's all this adding extra light come from? This is unique in the Talmud. Right? In the Talmud generally, those of you who are not into the Talmud probably have a general impression that rabbis like to make life hard. Well, in the Talmud, uh, every time there's a kind of a choice between a lenient way and a more strict way, the Talmud tends to pick the more lenient way because they want to make it possible for people to do. So if you make it very strict, people can't do it. So the Talmud tends to say, well, as between this and that, we take the more lenient way. If you've heard of Hillel and Shammai, these two great rabbis, they uh, founded two schools of thought like Oxford and Cambridge or Yale and Harvard or whatever. Right. And their schools of thought pursued their ways of thinking. And the uh, way of Shammai was more strict, more stringent. The way of Hillel was more lenient, more sympathetic to the realities of the people. And nearly always where there's a dispute in the Talmud, we follow the view of Hillel, which is the more uh, lenient way. Um, by the way, there's a dispute as between Hillel and Shammai's schools uh, as to how to light the Hanukkah lights. So Shammai says, what you do is you start the eight days with all eight candles lit. And then each day you light one less till on the last day you only have one left. Why? Because this must be what happened to the oil, right? You started with a full pot, 
by the end, you ended up with an empty pot. So, of course, you start with the full thing and you can work your way down. This is uh, accurate, um, practical information, right? If what we're trying to do is reproduce uh, a narrative about quantities of oil, then, of course, Shema, Shammai is right. That's, that's the truth of it. There was a lot of oil and there was a little oil. But Hillel, of course, is interested in reproducing not the, um, the information about the oil. He's, he's interested in introducing something about the quality of the miracle. And clearly, the miracle increased every day. Well, it's no great surprise. In fact, one wonders, why do we light eight candles if the oil lasted eight days? Because, of course, there were only seven days of miracle. The first day is no miracle. You've got enough, wine, uh, enough oil for the first day. So then you should only have a seven-branched candelabrum. Well, that's interesting. They already had a seven-branched candelabrum, but they didn't do that. They made an eight-branched one. Why eight days? I've told you already. Are you paying attention? Because they were doing a, a Sukkot-type thing, right? So we've got an eight-day thing. Anyway, in the Talmud, uh, they ask, right? This is, there's no mention of Hanukkah in the Mishnah. So let's get our timetables right here, folks. The Maccabim oh, were in the year 165 or so BCE. So before Christmas and all that stuff, okay? BCE, uh, 165 to 162, most people say those are the years of the battle of the Maccabim. And therefore, they probably rededicated the temple probably in 162 BCE. Um, the Mishnah is put together, written down, in about the year 200 CE. So 350 years later, more, 350 years later, they write the Mishnah, and yet in the Mishnah, they do not mention Hanukkah at all. It's just not mentioned. Now, that's rather interesting, because the Mishnah is talking about Jewish practice, but they don't mention Hanukkah. 300 years later, two, 300 years later, they're writing the commentary and discussion that arises out of the Mishnah. Remember, the Mishnah is written in the year 200, maybe in the year 450, 500 or so. They're pulling together this commentary, this discussion called the Gemara, right? And in the Gemara, they, they're discussing what kinds of lights can you use to light on Shabbat. Right, so the famous section called Bame Madlikin. What kinds of lights can you use? Can you use this kind of wick? Can you use that kind of oil? Because, of course, remember, in those days, they mostly were not using candles. They were using oil and wicks, right? What kind of wicks can you use? What kind of candles can you use? Okay, that's Shabbat. And in this discussion, somebody says, is it the same for the lights of Hanukkah? And the Talmud says, the Gemara says, my Hanukkah, what's Hanukkah? Now, of course, they're not asking that question because nobody's got a clue. They're asking the question because they realize that nowhere else has anybody referred to Hanukkah. So now they realize if we're going to raise the topic of Hanukkah, we need to define what it is. And so in the Talmud, they say, what's Hanukkah? And it's there at last in the year 400-ish that they say Hanukkah is the occasion when the oil miraculously lasted for eight days. Now, folks, this is 600 years after the event, 550 years after the event that they first mention it's the miracle of the oil. Then they go on to say, and now we're supposed to celebrate Kanka, right? Well, they say, you light a light and you put it in the doorway every night of the eight days of Kanka. Do any of us do that? No, we don't. Because they go on to say, but those who really want to take this seriously, right, who want to make the mitzvah more fabulous, madrin, to make it more beautiful, right, those people will light a light for everybody in the household. Not clear with every man or every person or every adult or every child, it's not clear, but they will light a light for everybody in the household. So there's five people living at home. You don't put one light out in the doorway, you put five lights out in the doorway, right? 
Uh, presumably homes in those times probably didn't necessarily have windows on the street. You know, there might be in a courtyard or something. Why do you put it in the doorway? You're trying to make a public statement about the miracle. It's one of the very, very rare occasions in Jewish practice where you are supposed to show the world what you're doing. Every other Jewish behavior you can keep private, you can do publicly, it doesn't make any difference, right? But here you're required to show it to the world. That's why people nowadays put the Chanukiyah in the window. That's why Chabad love to put up these huge Chanukiyot in public places, right? Because you're supposed to show the world what you're doing. So now folks, we've got lots of people lighting lots of lights in the front door. Um, usually by the doorpost opposite the mezuzah. Now that's quite nice, isn't it? You have mezuzah on one side, you have your Hanukkah torch burning on the other. That's a very nice public uh, manifestation. This is a Jewish household. But they go on to say, those who want to be mahadrin the mahadrin, more fancy than anybody else, super from, fancy it all up more than anybody else, they will light an extra light on every night. Now, this is the only occasion that I know of in the Talmud. There may be some others, but I don't know them. The only occasion in the Talmud where the common practice has become the most complicated practice. And so any of us who do Hanukkah at all will be doing that more complicated business of lighting an extra light and so on and so forth. And many families do indeed light a Chanukiah for each member of the family. That's a separate thing. But this idea of adding an extra light is, is super duper maxi frum in Talmudic terms. And, and that's become the normative practice. Very rare, very rare example. And that's where it tells us that the miracle of the oil happened in the Talmud, not in the book of Maccabees. Let's set that aside and let's go back to the history, folks. So the Greeks, right? Alexander the Great, well, he wasn't actually a Greek, he was a Macedonian, but it's near enough. Alexander the Great, or rather his father, Philip the Macedon. Uh, Philip of Macedon, Macedonia is in the north, just north of Greece. Macedonia conquered Greece and Philip moved his uh, kingdom, his seat, into Athens. He was very impressed by Athens, beautiful city, right? And his son, Alexander, was brought up in Athens. And in fact, uh, his father bought him the best tutoring money could buy. See, nothing changes. I'm sure it's still true in uh, California. Buy the best tutoring money can buy. And the best local tutor that Philip could buy for his son, Alexander, was somebody called Aristotle. Uh, so Aristotle had a, a business on the side uh, doing private tutoring for future world conquerors. And so Alexander had Aristotle as his tutor. And Alexander grew up in Athens, um, hugely also like his father, but even more so impressed by Athenian and Greek culture. And uh, Alexander effectively became Greekified, Hellenized. Uh, he, uh, Hellas is the Greek word for Greece. So Hellenized is to be Greekified, right? And um, he was very impressed by this culture. And when he set about conquering as much as he possibly could, Alexander the Great, who was a great conqueror, his uh, empire eventually stretched right across to India. It was a really huge empire. And the fact that he died when he was 33, or 35 or something. I mean, it's a pretty remarkable piece of conquering that Alexander got involved in. Um, but not only did he conquer these lands, he sought to promote Hellenistic Greek culture. So wherever he went, he wanted to teach local people about democracy and drama and uh, architecture and the Greek religion, the gods and so on and so forth. And everywhere he went, uh, these great buildings, these Greek style buildings and academies and colleges and schools and uh, tragedies and amphitheaters and so on got built as he projected Greek culture into these various places. Now, ever since then, of course, empires have done that too, more or less. So 
uh, the British in India or whatever would project uh, Shakespeare into Indian schools for the, the better educated. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, Americans uh, project uh, McDonald's, you know, wherever they go. Um, so uh, I, I'm trying to think of high American culture. I've got to McDonald's. Let me think a bit more. Jeans. OK, denim jeans. Um, whatever. I'm sure there's other aspects of American culture that just slip my mind at the moment. But empires, whether they're military empires, economic empires or whatever, they promote their culture into the place that they go. Uh, so uh, you can imagine that places that have been influenced by America, uh, many people in those places think of it as a, a certain cultural cachet to be Americanized. Of course, America is doing that perhaps through technology and through uh, economics more than they're doing it through military activity, but both. Um, that's how uh, empires work. Alexander did this very consciously. He wanted to promote Greek culture. He was convinced that it was the best culture around on the planet, and he wanted to encourage people to adopt it. Uh, however, like I told you, Alexander died young. And he not only died young, but he died without leaving a proper structure of succession behind him. And he said explicitly uh, in or around his deathbed, all right, something along the lines of may the best man win. All right, I will leave it to the victor. So uh, he had his uh, empire was already organized to some degree into uh, provinces, areas, um, and different folk immediately leapt forward to be the governors or the rulers or the, to be in charge of these different subsets of the Alexandrian empire. And the bit that concerns us is the area around the Middle East, around Jerusalem, where the Jews were uh, in this land. Alexander conquered Jerusalem uh, and the land of Israel. Um, and he, uh, when he died, two different territories um, competed for the control of the land of Israel, not because they were particularly excited about the land of Israel. It was a pretty nondescript uh, territory, but it's quite a pivotal place. Um, it is, uh, in a sense, the kind of uh, center point between the great um, uh, trading route, what was called the Fertile Crescent, that ran around the top of the Middle East. Uh, it also brought you to the coast, uh, like Lebanon does, to the coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, so it's quite an important territory. Uh, and down in the south, uh, the Egyptian territories were taken over by a family called the Ptolemies. Now, but Ptolemies, uh, although we recognize that name as an Egyptian name, they were very Greekified. Um, Cleopatra, who is eventually a descendant of the Ptolemies, uh, she is tremendous. She spoke Greek. She didn't speak Egyptian. She wouldn't have known how to speak Egyptian. She spoke Greek. She was uh, Hellenized. Uh, so that's the, the Egyptian territory. And the Egyptian territory and the Ptolemies took over the land of Israel pretty quickly. They just seized it for themselves. Meanwhile, up in the north, in around, um, uh, well, Damascus and further north, um, into Antioch and around there, which is now Turkey, uh, there were the Seleucids, S-E-L-E-U-C-I-D, the Seleucids. Uh, and they took over the northern uh, province, let's say, um, and the Seleucids were also um, uh, Hellenized. And after a while, the Ptolemies began to lose their grip a bit, and the Seleucids moved in and took over effectively most of the land of Israel. And these two, of course, are um, face to face across the land of Israel. Uh, Israel very much, and all through biblical times, uh, and, and after, of course, in the period we're talking about now, uh, the land of Israel is a bit like Belgium in Europe. You know, it's, it's not highly significant in itself, but it is a kind of buffer state between two great uh, warring nations, between France and Germany, for example, in uh, the 19th century in Europe. Um, so uh, so uh, the land of Israel becomes geopolitically significant as between these two uh, remnants of the Alexandrian Empire. But eventually, as I say, the Seleucids took over 
uh, the land of Israel. And there they were. And as far as uh, anybody was concerned, this was kind of business as usual pretty well. Uh, Alexander had conquered them. The Ptolemies were there for a while. The Seleucids took over uh, and the Jews carried on with their business. Now, what happened to the Jews living in the land of Israel? Let's remember, mostly Jews were centered around Jerusalem, right? They were not scattered all over the state of Israel we now know. They were mostly centered in and around Jerusalem, maybe uh, in some other locations around the what we now call the West Bank, the old uh, uh, Jordanian, uh, the plain of the River Jordan, somewhere around there. They probably were nowhere near the coast. Um, that was mostly sort of Philistine territory or their descendants. Um, they certainly weren't anywhere in the south, in the Negev or somewhere like that. They would have not gone any further south than Beersheba. They may have gone a little bit up into the north, but mostly that wasn't Jewish territory either. So they were in and around the Jerusalem area. And there they were. And they're just getting on with their business. They're a religious community. They don't have much agricultural activity. They don't have a lot of land. Um, they don't have any political power. Their religious leaders are their leaders. So if anybody wanted to talk to the Jews, they would go presumably to the high priest, perhaps, or somebody else nominated by him. Uh, that's the, the Jewish community. And what are the Jews doing? How are they living? Are they living, uh, as Alexandra would have liked, uh, Greekified lives? Are they going to theatre performances? Are they going to the uh, athletics um, uh, displays, the gymnastics, the competitions and so on? Uh, or are they firmly keeping Shabbat and refusing to eat anything that's not kosher and so on and so forth? Well, you may or may not be surprised to know that they were both. There were some people who were dead from and wouldn't have been seen near a bacon rasher, but there are other people who were really very attracted to this Greek style of life. And, you know, there's some kid who's good at running very fast. Well, he wants to be in the uh, Greek athletic games, you know, and if his mum won't let him, they're going to spend a lot of time complaining because why can't I? And there's nothing wrong. And anyway, God doesn't say anything about athletics in the Bible, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. So there were certainly Jews from that time who were Greekifying with enthusiasm. We know this from the Book of the Maccabees. The Book of the Maccabees says, for example, that there were, oh, perhaps you've forgotten, that Greek uh, uh, athletic competitions were performed in the nude. No, we're not talking women, of course they weren't in it, men. Men were performed in the nude. That, that's why they did statues like that. They didn't think anything, anything wrong about uh, people being in the nude. The body beautiful was important. Now that is, of course, deeply offensive to Jewish sensibilities of sliyut, of modesty, right, and, and that kind of thing. But there they were running about in the nude. Well, what did these Jewish athletes do? Because if you're in the nude and you're male, right, uh, women, you have to use your imagination at this point, men will just know, right? If you're in the nude and you're male, it's a little bit obvious that you're Jewish because you're circumcised. Well, that's not what you're supposed to do. There's the body beautiful. You're not supposed to be circumcised, right? So what did men start to do? They started to wear false foreskins. Now, I don't actually know where you buy one. Sorry, somebody's just taking a drink of coffee and spilt it all over themselves, right? False foreskins is what they used to wear. Um, now, this is uh, the worst of all possible behaviors. Now, I'm bad enough for false foreskin. But remember, your circumcision is the sign of the covenant to cover it up in front of the Greeks like you're ashamed of being Jewish. Who can imagine anybody being ashamed of being Jewish? I mean, such a thing should happen. Can you imagine? Right. So there were Jews who were doing this. So there are other Jews who thought it was dreadful. And you may not be surprised to know that the Jews started to fight over it. Right. Now, I know it's difficult to imagine that Jews should argue about such things, but they did. They started to fight over it. And back in Antioch, right, where the Seleucids were headquartered up there in Syria, basically, back there, um, the king of the time 
Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, he called himself Epiphanes because he thought he was rather special. Uh, but Antiochus Epiphanes heard the news of this battle. He had it explained to him that it was some people who were objecting to the kind of Greek stuff. And he thought, therefore, it was a rebellion against him. It wasn't. It was an internal Jewish conflict, right? But he thought it was a rebellion against him. And therefore, he moved his troops in to suppress the rebellion. And therefore turned on the, what should we call them, the, the, the Frum guys, right? They were called in those days the Hasidim. Right? Not the same as the Hasidim we have now, but that was the same name, the pious ones, right? He turned on these guys and in a very un-Hellenistic way, he sought to impose Hellenism. Now, you know, any good culture that is going to impact on a society doesn't need to impose itself, right? Nobody made a law saying thou shalt eat McDonald's. It just spread, right? It had a lot going for it and people wanted it. And you didn't need to make a rule insisting that people do it or, or wearing blue jeans, right? You just flog them around the world and people will buy because they, they work, they're there. You don't need to make a rule, right? And Tarkas Epiphanes didn't understand that. Greekiness was seeping into Jewish lands just like it was seeping into everywhere else. But he sought to speed things up, not least, and the Greeks were generally quite tolerant. You know, if you want to believe in this God, that's fine. You do it. We've got lots. We don't mind you having another one. It just wasn't a problem for them. But Antiochus Epiphanes was not having anything to do with this Jewish God. He took over the temple in Jerusalem. He installed a garrison in Jerusalem, a uh, military garrison in Jerusalem. And he installed a, uh, a, a, a statue, a, an idol to Zeus in the temple, right, the king of the Greek gods in the temple. Well, this, of course, even those who didn't mind, you know, eating McDonald's and wearing jeans, uh, that was a step too far for many of them. And this started to tip the balance and quite a number of those Greekified Jews began to feel, oh, oh, well, wait a minute, right? I don't mind fighting other Jews, but nobody else is allowed to do that. That's a Jewish business. Um, and so people got more and more fired up and angry about the way that Antiochus Epiphanes was trying to impose Hellenism on everybody. So now, guys, let's just remember where we are. <clears throat> Did the Jews fight the Greeks? No, they didn't. There weren't any Greeks there. Just remember this. There weren't any Greeks there, right? These people are Middle Eastern people who are Hellenized people. I mean, there might have been a Greek or two, right, there, but that wasn't the point. These people were Hellenized. They weren't fighting Greeks. They were fighting Greekiness. It was a cultural battle, not a military battle, right? Generally speaking, the Jews didn't have any military or political power prior to this, nor were they particularly seeking military or political power through this. What they were seeking was cultural autonomy, the capacity to live their lives as they wished without cultural impositions. Well, then we know what happened in the story, right? Matityahu, who was a, uh, a sub-priest, he wasn't high priest, he was living in Modin after all, um, but he was a, a, a priest, uh, Kohen, uh, and his sons <coughs> um, attacked to the uh, Seleucid forces, took to the hills, it's a very important moment one time when the Seleucids attacked the uh, Maccabean uh, strongholds on Shabbat and the Maccabeans didn't, couldn't fight back because you're not supposed to do such things on Shabbat. And it was out of the massacre that emerged uh, on that occasion that the principle was born that I'm sure all of you know now that uh, you can break Shabbat to save life. Right? They hadn't come across that before. Um, and it's lucky the principle was uh, firmly established in time for the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Um, so uh, they had to think that one out, right? And they had to get that one straight. Uh, but they, they did, and they carried on fighting. And as you know, they successfully managed to drive the garrison out of Jerusalem and secure 
Jerusalem and the temple again. They didn't drive the Seleucids out of the land of Israel for quite a little while more. It took a little while longer for them to do, but they did manage to get the temple back. They cleaned it up uh, and rededicated it. And that's Chinuch, Hanukkah is dedication, right? So this is about uh, rededicating the temple. Hanukkah means dedication. Some of you might know that a related word is the modern Hebrew word for education, Chinuch, um, which tells you something about the Jewish view of education as against the Latin view. Education is a Latin word, educare, right? Uh, educare means to lead out, to lead out, right? Um, yeah, il duce, yeah? The, the leader, the, the Mussolini was il duce, the leader, right? Educare, uh, to lead out, implies that all the knowledge you need is inside you. And all I need to do as a teacher is to draw it out of you. Okay, what does this tell us? It tells us that all wisdom is human. Wisdom lies inside you. The truth is within you. Right? The Jewish word for education is chinuch, which is related to dedication. Right here, we're not trying to lead someone out. We are trying to devote someone to something which is outside them. They need to learn wisdom from the sources. You just look at uh, Plato's uh, dialogues. Right. This is all about people teasing out the truth through discussion, through conversation. You find the truth from within what people can think for themselves. Man is the measure of all things, said Protagoras, one of the sophists of the fifth century, right? Um, this idea is completely contrary to a Jewish idea where wisdom lies in the texts, in revelation, in God's knowledge, right? We understand virtue by seeking to come as close to that which God wants us to do, and so on. As opposed to the way Greeks do it, they understand virtue by talking it through and teasing it out and trying to decide what does society think is virtuous. And that's all centered around the word chinuch, education, as opposed to education, and chanukah, the idea of dedicating. Right. So on Chanukah, we lit the candelabrum again. Let's not worry about the miracle. We created a... a, a we rededicated the temple and we were back on track. What about these Maccabim? Now, the Maccabim very rapidly transmuted into the ruling family. Uh, they became the high priests. Uh, the other high priests, uh, the people who were high priests previously, uh, got junked because they were considered to be uh, compromising Hellenizers. Right? Um, this Maccabi family was not from the family of Tzadok. Some of you all know the piece of music, Tzadok the priest, right? Tzadok, from which we get the word Sadducees, the Tzadukim, the ones descended from Tzadok. He's the high priest. But the Maccabee family was not the high priest. They were Kohanim, but they took over and they declared themselves high priests, right? Um, not only that, uh, they also became political leaders. Now, if you know anything about Jewish, uh, Jewish principles, um, you can't have a political leader who's also a priest, right? The Kohanim are the priests, and those descend, sort of descended from Aaron, and the king is descended from Judah, isn't he? He's a different tribe. He's not one of the Levium, he's one of the uh, Yehudim, the Judeans, Judans. Um, so you have to be descended from David to be the king. Well, how could they square that particular circle? They said, look, you know, there isn't anybody around at the moment who does this. So we'll just hold the, hold the seat warm till we find the descendant of Judah who's supposed to be the true king. Maybe the Messiah will come, whatever it is. So in the meantime, we'll be the political leaders as well. Now, this idea of mixing religious and political leadership is quite a Greek idea. How do they come to do that? Well, within two generations, the descendants of, uh, of uh, Matityahu, 
Mattathias and his sons, you know, the famous Judah, the Maccabee, and so on, um, they, uh, they were calling themselves things like uh, Aristobulus, John Hicarnus, Salome, right? These are all Greek names, right? They Greekified like there was no tomorrow. Um, the Hasmoneans became effectively a Greek um, leadership or a Hellenized leadership of the Jewish people. Um, not only that, they introduced an idea which we're all now so familiar with, we don't realize how Greek it is. They introduced the idea of conversion. Now, the Hasmoneans were massively successful as a political military uh, group. Uh, they conquered all of the land of Israel and more, so that the Hasmonean kingdom was bigger than the land of Israel, the country of Israel, had been since the time of King Solomon. Right? We don't talk about this very much, by the way, because the rabbis didn't like them at all. Right? Why? Because they were centered on the temple and they were very interested in preserving uh, temple privileges. The rabbis didn't like that. They didn't think that these people were interested in the ordinary people. The rabbis were very much interested in the ordinary people. And they largely wanted to diminish their role. It's no coincidence that the Book of Maccabees, which is a seriously religious book, I mean, it goes on and on about the role of God in the miraculous outcome and how did they win the few against the many and so on and so forth. Right? It's a really religious book. doesn't make it into the Bible. Right? Why not? Well, because the rabbis were deciding what goes in the Bible. Right? How come we don't know anything about, you know, Hasmonean history? It's just not taught. No, nobody talks about it. And when the rabbis finally do discuss Hanukkah, which I think one can suspect was not a festival that they particularly wanted to promote, but the people kept going on about it, so they couldn't abolish it. Right? When they finally do discuss it, they go, ah, it's all about a miracle. It's got nothing to do with the military success, it's got nothing to do with the, uh, the rededicating of the temple and the creation of the festival of Sukkot again. It's got nothing to do with the reestablishment of the priesthood or any of that stuff. It's all about a miracle. God did Hanukkah, not the Hasmoneans. While the Hasmoneans were busy conquering the land of Israel, they found all kinds of groups of people living in it. One such group was called the Idumeans. The Idumeans living just around uh, the east bank of the Jordan, um, uh, descended probably from the biblical Edomites, right? The uh, Hasmoneans conquered them and said, look, we give you a fair choice because we're decent people. You can either become Jews or you can leave. It's one or the other. Uh, if you want to stay, then you're dead, or you become Jews, up to you. Well, the Edumeans go, well, all right, look, we'll become Jews then, fair enough. Now, I don't know how they became Jews, but they all became Jews that day. Uh, they signed a paper, or they said, uh, you know, Baruch Hashem, I don't know what, what made them Jews, but they became Jews. The conversion of the Edumeans was so suspect that when many years later, somebody descended from the Idumeans, became king of Israel, many Jews denied that he could be so. The name of that man was Herod. And Herod was descended from the Idumeans. And the rabbis were continuously unsure about whether Herod could indeed be king of the Jews. And we know how Greek Hellenized Herod was. We know that he was into building buildings. And that's very Greek, you know, like building building stuff. But not only that, it looks like Herod was desperately trying to curry favor with the Jews to persuade him that he was one of them, as it were, not least by uh, gussying up the temple as he did. Right. Now, why is this a significant fact that they converted the Idumeans? If you had asked in the year 500 BCE, could anybody become something else? They would have laughed their heads off at you. Right? Could someone become a Greek or a Carthaginian or an Egyptian or an Israelite? You go, well, of course they couldn't. 
right? And, and if you and I think about it now, we probably have a similar sense of improbability. If I said to you, could I become French? You can't. I mean, French, you know, you can't. I could get a French passport. I become naturalized. I could do that political thing. But could I become a Frenchman? Of course I couldn't. Maybe if I moved to France and I married a French woman, I had French children and so on and so forth, my children would be French. Yeah, I think you could do that, right? They'd learn how to shrug and do all that stuff. But me, I, I couldn't become French, right? Could you become a Mexican? Well, it's just a stupid question. How could you become a Mexican? Now, living in America, of course, your national identity is entirely political. Right. It's, it's constructed out of passport. You become an American by Americans going, yeah, OK, you're American. Right. But it says nothing about your cultural provenance. So you can have uh, Latinos and Italians and Irish and so on and so forth. They're all hyphenated Americans. Right. But if you go to, like I say, you go to Mexico, you become a Mexican. You can't do it. Right? Uh, a Jamaican decides he's going to be a Nigerian. It's not going to happen. You can't, you can't do it. It's Jamaican. Right. Where did the Hasmoneans get the idea that you could go to the Idumeans and say, become Jews? It's crazy. Unless you're a Hellenist. Because what Alexander taught the world was you can all become Greek. All you need to do is adopt the culture, speak like us, act like us, do it like us. You can be one of us. That was a Hasman, that was a Hellenistic concept, and the Hasmoneans bought it fully. So I'm going to stop there with the question that I start with. Who won at Hanukkah, the Greeks or the Jews? You and me, for are we more Jewish or are we more Greek? And if we don't want to aim this at ourselves, just ask yourself about the Jews of the time. Finally, when you look in the Talmud and you see the dialectic form of debate by which they tease out answers, did they learn that from Moses or did they learn it from Plato? I don't know what I think, but I'll leave it to you as to what you think. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for um, <clears throat> giving us now seven days here to unpack. <laughs> what you've taught us. And thank you for bringing together so much history in 45 minutes. It was excellent. A great tutorial on Hanukkah and uh, the Seleucid Greeks and the Ptolemaic Egyptians and so on. So um, there are a few things you skipped, however, so I want to go over them and people are asking questions. Uh, one of them is, is it a coincidence that our holiday is on the 25th of the month and that Christmas is on the 25th of a month? Um, uh, is the 25th, uh, and is, it, is that significant in other traditions, is my question? Um, not really, no. Uh, the Romans had something around the 25th uh, that was uh, Saturnalia, um, which is why Christmas falls on the 25th of the month. Uh, but it would seem uh, that Kislev, the 25th of Kislev, I mean, it's a very strange time to have a festival in the land of Israel. I mean, the, the biblical calendar um goes to sleep through the winter right basically the 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 active year is from Pesach to Sukkot right spring to autumn uh and you have some preparatory months leading up to spring with uh with Purim and before that Tu Bishvat and so on um so the winter time is a time for nothing much to happen and that was true in the ancient world altogether I mean uh um People didn't uh, move about much. People didn't. Uh, wars weren't fought. Uh, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't mobilize your troops. It was too cold. It was uh, too rainy, too muddy. You couldn't get your cavalry around and so on. Right. So it tended to do things in the springtime and the summer um, up in uh, through to the autumn, through the, to the fall, as you'd say. Um, uh, so doing something on the 25th of Kislev suggests that this is entirely about the day on which they could do it. It's not a natural day to have any kind of festival. Um, as far as the Roman Saturnalia was concerned, this is very definitely about um, uh, pushing back darkness. And that does relate to the 21st 
of December, the uh, winter solstice. Uh, why the 25th? Well, there was a lot of shifting of days, remember, uh, before Julius Caesar introduced the leap year, uh, the Roman calendar had started to slip um, uh, and Julius Caesar had to correct that. Um, then Pope Gregory, 1500 years later, had to correct it again, that's the Gregorian calendar. Um, so the 25th was as near as, damn it, the winter solstice. Uh, but the 25th of Kislev, as we know now, uh, could be in November or could be in December. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it's not fixed in that way. Um, so I think it probably is a historical coincidence. I don't think there's anything to 25. Um, a question from Dale. So the, the Hasmoneans, the later generations, did they stay, were they um, religiously Jewish? Did they, did they, you know, adopt other forms of Hellenism or did they, were they recognizable? within that world of Judaism? Well, um, they were. Let's remember, of course, at the time of, uh, say, for example, at the time of Jesus, we have at least these two big blocks of the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the Pharisees, broadly the rabbinic school, uh, it's slightly anachronistic, but uh, you know what I mean. And the Sadducees are broadly the, um, the temple-orientated uh, um, uh, priesthood and and Roman uh, the people who are trying to keep that balance in in the political world that's the Hasmoneans they're broadly in that Sadducean thing the Sadduceans were mostly uh, resistant to a number of rabbinic ideas not least the oral Torah uh, what we now know as the Talmud halachic Judaism rabbinic Judaism which is what most of us have inherited, um, but the Sadducees were resistant to that, not least because the rabbis were busily interpreting away the centrality of the temple. First of all, they were uh, working with the synagogue framework. Uh, they were much more interested in interpreting what things that had been restricted to the temple into ordinary domestic Jewish life, right? So for example, when we, uh, when we wash our hands before our motzi, uh, or even possibly when we shecked kosher food just for our own eating, um, we may be adopting their behaviours which were previously specifically around temple worship, but we've now brought it into, uh, into daily Jewish behaviour. That's very rabbinic. Uh, so the Sadducees didn't like that. Um, so, yeah, they were recognisably part of the Jewish people, recognisably part of the uh, sort of religious establishment, but their interpretation was uh, somewhat suspect. Another group at that time that you may have heard of were the Essenes, and that group took to the hills, went off into the Judean desert, anticipating the end of days. They thought that the last days were coming, not least because of the Romans, but also because they just thought things had gone to hell in a handcart. And, and one of their strong uh, disapprovals was the way in which the temple and its priesthood behaved. So the, the Essenes, who were probably themselves Kohanim priests um, took took uh, took off to the desert in order to kind of sit out the last days and disassociate themselves from what they saw to be the kind of contaminated behaviour of, of the um, uh, of the temple clique. Um, and you see a lot of that kind of talk uh, in the New Testament too, um, which blurs. The distinction between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but if you read it carefully, you can see a lot of the dis dislike is what's going on in the temple. You know, obviously things have changed because we don't have infighting in the Jewish community today. No, quite. That's a wonderful so, thing, isn't it? It is. Um, the <clears throat> word the word Hashmonaim has Menian. Where did that come from? That's one of the questions in the chat. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, uh, you know, I don't know. I've never stopped to think about it. What a good question. Well done, whoever asked that. I still don't know. Um, okay, well, we'll look it up. I'll have, have to answers. look it up. I have, yeah, I have yeah. an easier okay. question. Yes. Uh, why do we eat jelly donuts for Hanukkah? Donuts, well, maybe the, I get, but the jelly part. Actually, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but because I, I can share it. Anyway. No, no, I would, I would say, first of all, you call it jelly and we call it jam. So, I mean, you know, tomato, tomato. It jelly sounds um, disgusting. We'll go with Yeah, jam. it does. It does sound bad, you know. Um, but uh, I, I think that's because donuts are so fundamentally boring 
And unless you do something to jazz them up, you can't ever think of them as something celebratory. That, that would be my explanation. I think there's a historic reason I, I will share with people about <laughs> something in Poland and ingredients. And yeah, it's, it's the blood libel proving that um, it's... The ra- let's, let's, yeah, let's talk about the rabbis and the menorah. It just seems like this is the example of, of the ludicrous. I mean, we have the rabbis explaining a lot of things around, and you can probably live with many things, but this seems to be a tradition of lighting candles. The rabbis decided they would take it over. And so now you have every rule under the sun, how long it has to last, what you can use for your candles, that they have your menorah is not kosher. Unless every, you know, they, they, they have to be the same plane, um, so on and so forth. Did the rabbis, were they intentionally just trying to drive people crazy. What, what, what was, <laughs> why did they have so many rules of something that was obviously not biblical? Well, the fact that something isn't biblical doesn't doesn't prevent us from having rules about it. I mean, we do all kinds of things which aren't uh, biblical, or we do them in ways which are not biblical. So, for example, I guess anybody on this call who has a mezuzah uh, takes a little piece of parchment, sticks it in a little box, and puts it on the right hand doorpost, sloping, facing in. You know all that stuff. Right. And what you write on that little piece of parchment is specific bits of Torah. None of that is in the Torah. Right. It says you shall write these words on the top base of your house. Well, write them then, for goodness sake. Well, stick in little bits of parchment in a box. Right? This is all the oral tradition. This is all how the rabbis determined that something should be done. We do it that way. Um, so I don't think we need to be too worried about why the rabbis got involved in the Hanukkah. It is worth noting perhaps the idea that every candle should be on a level is saying that every day of Hanukkah is equal to every other day we're not we're not rising to a climax or falling to a uh, fall every day of Hanukkah is equal I, I'm sure many of you will have seen some beautiful Hanukkah this lovely lovely art uh, Judaica art but if you're bothered about these things, uh, some of those beautifully uh, designed Hanukkiyot are not kasher, if you're worried about the halakhic thing. They should, all the candles should be on an even level, so that, not least, you can see which one is the shamash, which is the one that is not part of the candles, because it's on a different level, either out in front or down below or up higher or whatever. Um, that they should burn for a certain period of time, is entirely about the business of doing a mitzvah. The the mitzvah is not just to light the candles, but to see them, to have them. So then there's a question, how long do they have to last to be had, to be enjoyed, to be seen? Um, So you could imagine somebody who's a bit worried about their neighbors seeing their Hanukkah. You know, they quickly, they light the candles and they blow them all out again and go, right, I did the job. Right? But they have to be there so that they can be seen. Now, then you get a question, well, how long is that? So the rabbis decided half an hour. For those of you, so they've got to burn for 30 minutes. Uh, those of you concerned about these technicalities, and I don't expect you all to be anally retentive about this stuff. Um, but for those of you who are, um, if you're lighting them on Friday, of course, before Shabbat, uh, you've lit them far too early for them to burn at nightfall. So they're supposed to be lit in the dark, not in the twilight. So if you're lighting them on Shabbat, you have to light them before Shabbat, of course. You light them before your Shabbat candles, but you have to, on those occasions, you have to choose candles that are going to burn for about an hour and a half, or at least an hour. Uh, so the little pretty coloured ones don't necessarily do the job. Um, but I think, you know, rabbis always say, want to just help people not worry. So look, I will tell you how to do it. Do it like this. You'll be fine. Um, it's not necessarily right. helpful. Well, it, the reason that it's a little different than the the like mezuzah is the mezuzah is in the Bible. There's something. In other words, the menorah is completely not a biblical tradition. The rabbis oh, then right. threw, you know, all their laws and regulations on there, and it made it complicated for people and maybe upset some people. But it is what it is. That's what I think. That's what rabbis do. They try to make but it they, easier. And sometimes they did support. Harder. They did support the candle making industry to a significant degree. And um, however, the candles of Hanukkah don't have to be of the same quality as the candles of Shabbat. So the candles of Shabbat must not flicker and be in danger of going out. 
Whereas the candles of Conagra, they go out, so they go out. I mean, a lot of us have experienced that, you know, you get weird candles that suddenly one of them burns down in a minute and a half. And uh, you mentioned Limud, Ari, when we've had Limud and it happens to be Hanukkah, so Limud gathers maybe 3,000 people. And if it's Hanukkah, in the last days of Hanukkah, we all go into a hall and everybody lights their own Hanukkah. The place is blazing with light and heat. On one occasion, we had the fire service come around because the fire alarms were set off. Um, but in that heat, just about every candle melts to a puddle within about a minute and a half, right? But it's the intention. You're trying to burn them for half an hour rather than not bothering. It's great to see a thousand Hanukkah lit. lit. That's, right. that's a fabulous one. I've seen, I don't know whether it's a video <clears throat> or a cartoon, and it was, what would happen if Christmas trees were Jewish? And it has rabbi, all the rabbinic rules about Christmas trees. <laughs> well, folks, just about Christmas trees. I saw somebody um, trying to score points against uh, what they called Christianism. I wouldn't go there, frankly, folks. Let Christians do their own thing. And get good and hate them you know it's 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 got some beautiful aspects of it uh the theology is to my mind a little bit strange but in general you know people do it right they're nice people and so we don't have to attack them um but uh what is strange i think uh is that um i don't know what you do in in california but people buy christmas trees here and then after about a month they put them out on the street to be taken away by the you know garbage folk um and that sometimes uh, will be this year. It's, it's just about the time for Tu B'Shvat when Jews are planting trees. And I find myself very much prouder of the fact that we have a festival for planting trees rather than a festival for cutting them down. Uh, I like that. Um, you, do, and, you, do, uh, you do forget that we throw yeah. our lulavs into the garbage right after. Our, yeah, our, but our... cutting down a tree is an extremely different thing to cutting a branch. Um, the very nature of trees is that when you cut their trunks, they can't regrow. That is what distinguishes a tree between, between a tree and a bush. Um, and cutting down a tree, however much you make it into a recyclable industry, just seems to me to be a very strange uh, concept. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, we, it, it ought to make us, especially in a Christmas tree land, even more dedicated to Tukashpat, because you've got even more to put right. Uh, not only plant a tree because you should plant a tree, you have to plant another tree in order to put right your neighbor's uh, Christmas tree as well. Um, so Tupishvat should be a big deal for us. That's yeah. our equivalent it's of Christmas. Something to look forward to. The, the related <clears throat> question to the lights, you know, when you said the Talmud said you have to have the extra light, is that the question? Was that the Shamash or is that a different candle we're talking about? No, that's the Shamash. And that's because unlike the Shabbat lights, um, you shouldn't use the Hanukkah lights. The Hanukkah lights are only there to display the glory of the miracle. So Shabbat lights are there precisely to be used. They are there in order to give you light. And so you can read by the Shabbat lights. On Yom Tov, for example, where you can light a light from another light. I remember when people used to smoke, they used to light their cigarettes from the Yom Tov candles, right? That's, they're there to be used. You can use them. Um, but uh, on, and you can smoke on the Yomtum, there's nothing against that. Um, but uh, um, the Hanukkah lights, you can't use at all. And there's a very widespread tradition that women in particular did not work while the Hanukkah lights were lit. So perhaps if a woman had thought, well, I'll just sit by the Hanukkah lights and, and uh, sew my kerchief or whatever women used to do in that way, uh, you don't. You don't do work by the light of the Hanukkah candles. Um, and therefore they are quite different and uh, unutilizable. Um, again, if you have a, a yard site light burning and you just want to be able to read that a bit more clearly and lean over into the yard site light, that's fine. You can read by it. It's not a problem. As a Abdallah candle, many people say Abdallah by the light of the candle. That's all they can see. But Hanukkah candles, you need to have another light so that if you do want to read by them or something, you have the shamash that you're using because the candles, the Hanukkah lights themselves should be only there to proclaim the miracle. And uh, thank you. The, Robin asks about the Seleucids. So if they weren't Greeks, like who would you say they really were? They were they Syrians. Were, they were Syrians. So okay. Syrians. Um, they were by Syrian, the time Seleucid which, Greeks. How do you yeah, like? Well, the... they were they were they were Middle Easterns. They were Middle Eastern folk. 
Um, by the time uh, we're talking, the Assyrians, the ancient uh, empire of the Assyrians, had fallen away. Uh, the Seleucids were the inheritors of that northern kingdom, empire. The whole Bible is a narrative of the conflict or the tension between the Egyptian empire in the south, uh, southwest, and the um, northern empire, which was sometimes Babylonians, Mesopotamians, Chaldeans, Hittite, uh, Assyrians, and so on, the northern empire in the northeast of the land of Israel. Um, and, the, and the entire books of the prophets could be summed up by prophets saying to kings, for goodness sake, don't get involved. And King saying, no, actually, I think I know how to finesse this. I'm sure I can get it right. Right. And the whole story is the king's getting it wrong and the prophet's getting it right, telling them not to get involved in this clash of mighty opposites between the Egyptians and the northern power. Uh, the two great powers of the rivers. Yes, the Nile River on the one hand and the Tigris and the Euphrates on the other. And all the land of Israel has, of course, is this muddy little trickle uh, of the Jordan. Um, uh, you know, quite different kind of place. So by the time we come along, the Assyrians have faded. Uh, subsequent uh, powers, we're, not, we're a bit south of, uh, of the Persians, um, uh, the Medes. Uh, so they're Assyrians, I guess. So we're going to finish up very shortly. Um, people have asked um, about Limud UK. So I think there's probably a website I can share with people. Yeah, www.limud.org. Org. But is Limud one M or two M's? Two M's. L I W M U D. Limud. Are you teaching in Limud this year? I'm oh, doing man. a session. Yeah, I am. Uh, can't remember what it is. Anybody particular we should look for at Limud? Like anybody, any of your favorite teachers are coming that we should like not miss? I mean, I, oh, I'm like I have Lainey, no idea. Like Lainey uh, Friedman, I'm sending her like, this is how we find our great speakers. I send people to Limud. That's how we got like Rafi Zaram and a lot of other people. I send them <clears> and they say, we went Limud either in person or online. You should definitely bring this person. That's yeah, well, I mean, you mentioned a couple of people in, uh, that you have on your program who are uh, folk who presented at Limud. I think Limud has had nearly anybody who can say anything intelligent. Um, over the years. There are usually about 350, uh, 400 presenters in each Limud festival. Um, when it's not in person, there's slightly fewer, uh, but uh, there are hundreds of presenters on every topic. If it's Jewish enough for you, it's Jewish enough for Limud pretty well. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff there. And then final question for now, which is, um, so how do you guys celebrate in London? Is um, Do you have big, like in the United States, we do have Chabad running around, putting up the menorahs everywhere. In fact, I went to Chabad yesterday, did a great, <coughs> great local um, celebration for the first night of Hanukkah. They're very impressive. Um, but I, I sometimes think the uh, Jewish community in England is a little more reserved, but I don't know. So is there, I mean, I don't know what you're doing during COVID, for example, but before COVID, was this a big public celebration or is it more private? And then what are you doing? What do you guys do for COVID? I, I don't think it's, uh, well, nothing is as commercialized as it is in the States, uh, I think. I mean, that's just a kind of a cultural thing almost. Um, so I don't think Hanukkah is as commercialized. I don't think, um, uh, I, I, because I, I'm not, I mean, Christmas is, I suppose. Um, but I don't think Jews have gone quite so much for making Hanukkah the equivalent a kind of equivalent scale as Christmas, perhaps. Um, I think there's very much more giving of gifts to children than the need to exchange gifts between adults, I think. Uh, but I don't know how it happens in America. I, I, I'm only going by what I've read. Uh, I've we we do we that. do McDonald gift certificates. <laughs> well, that's good to know that culture thrives there. Um, I... Uh, I think, I mean, the Chabad, yes, they like their kind of kiyot and do all that stuff and drive about with things on the tops of their cars. Um, I, I, generally speaking, the profile of Jews is, is lower in Britain than it is in the States. So it's not, I remember as a child, um, there was one DJ on the radio who used to wish everybody a happy new year on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, he wasn't Jewish. But it was just remarkable. Every Jew knew that this guy, Pete Murray, 
would wish everybody Happy New Year on Rosh Hashanah because nobody else did. It just wasn't heard on the national radio on BBC or whatever. But yesterday, listening to the classic, uh, classical music station, they had a rabbi on doing a selection of music for Hanukkah, an hour selection of music for the first day of Hanukkah. That's quite rare. Um, and it was a pretty poor selection of music, I have to say. But um, he paid a dirge version of Ma Watsur, <laughs> which nearly sent me to sleep. But anyway, um, so it's, I suspect none of these things are as visible as they are in the States, um, I, I think. Uh, you're not likely to see any Hanukkah reference in a shopping street, probably, uh, you know, in, in, in a store or in a mall or something like that. Highly improbable. Yeah, you know, I, I carry around in my car <clears throat> massive menorahs, and then wherever I see a Christmas tree, like in my lobby, I just shove the menorah down there. Just, make, <laughs> yeah, yeah. just to teach them a lesson. I, I'm Guys, joking. this, is, I'm joking. this okay. does not have to be a competition. Okay, it's not it's a zero joking, sum and, I, and I don't yeah. buy I don't <laughs> buy gift cards from uh, from uh, McDonald's for anybody. Oh, I believe that. I really don't. Okay. I'm, I mean, I'm kosher and I'm vegetarian, so it would be pretty bad. All right. Well, they do but, a salad, uh, don't they? Okay. Okay, everybody. Well, listen. I hope that you've enjoyed this uh, Hanukkah-centered program with Clive Lund coming to us from the UK. He's on night two. We're in day one here. Ahuva, hopefully you had a nice first evening in Southern California. And, and Chuck Chatlin, you too. And Lainey, I can see you. Um, the rest of you, lots of nights coming up. Please celebrate um, carefully. And um, go out there and eat your disgusting jelly donut, if that's what you want. Try latkes, guys. There's nothing wrong with the old ways. Latkes, latkes, go for it. You know, I read an article about air fried <coughs> latkes, which I think is pretty strange. Oh, um, point. yeah, it seems that they, like the, the rabbis would not be happy with that. They probably say in the Talmud, you may not air fry your latkes, right? Well, it's got to have oil. That's the right. point of it. You're right. not using oil. Exactly. No point at all. Yeah. Guys, go for chips. What do you call them? French fries. Yeah. I mean, that's very authentic. That's what the rabbis used to do. Yeah. That's right. Okay. And by the way, I, mean, I, have to, I haven't done my research, but I have a feeling the rabbis, you know, they, they used to work for a living. They didn't get paid by their community, right? They mm. probably were yeah. candle makers. That's my guess. Yeah. <laughs> if not, Mrs. writers. Okay. okay. Everybody, yeah. take care. Bye bye, all. Bye, Clive. Nice, nice. Bye bye. Thanks for including me. See you at Limud. Bye. Indeed.